Alfred Bernard Nobel, inventor of the Nobel Peace Prize in Dynamite, was born in Stockholm, Sweden on October 21, 1833. Alfred was the second of four sons, the eldest being Robert, the next youngest being Ludwig, and the closest of his brothers, Emil. Alfred's father, Emanuel, was both an engineer and inventor for construction in Stockholm, but in 1837 he emigrated to work in St. Petersburg because of his debt and the need for money to support his family. His mother, Andriette Assel, grew up in a wealthy family, so she was not accustomed to being in financial trouble. When she found out about the problem, she started a grocery store to help keep a modest budget for the family. In the year of 1842, Alfred was reunited with Emmanuel, who had managed to pay off all his debts by creating naval mines for the Russian army. Alfred's years of inventing started in 1850, when his parents financed a study trip, partly to lead Alfred away from writing, and partly to give Alfred the opportunity to learn about inventing. Alfred's first stop on this trip was in New York, where he was taught by fellow Swedish inventor John Ericsson. Determined to find out all he could about Ericsson's inventions, Alfred learned many things about engineering, explosives, and what it takes to be an inventor. After New York, Alfred went to study in Paris, where he worked with Asconio Sobrero, the Italian inventor of the unpredictable liquid explosive nitroglycerin. While in Paris, Alfred had a chance to work in the laboratory of Theophile Juice Poulois, who not only was an inventor, but was also the teacher of Sobrero. In the laboratory, Alfred learned mainly about nitroglycerin and its limitations. Out of this event in Alfred's life came a path to divert Alfred away from his love of poetry writing and direct him towards a life of inventing. Unfortunately, Alfred never actually saw nitroglycerin. In 1852, after his study abroad trip, Alfred returned to Russia to help his father's company because of a business boom. The Crimean War had started, and in aid to the company's business boom, Alfred and Emmanuel experimented with explosive material for the naval mines. In 1855, however, Alfred was ready to have a change of scenery, so he decided to work with Russian professor Nikolai Zinin, who had also been taught by Professor Polois. With Zinin, Alfred for the first time in his life actually saw nitroglycerin. He also learned about nitroglycerin's functions and experimented with it. Later on in his life, when Alfred was asked about his first experience with nitroglycerin, he replied, The first time I saw nitroglycerin was in the beginning of the Crimean War. Professor Zinin in St. Petersburg exhibited some to my father and me, and struck some on an anvil to show that only the part touched by the hammer exploded without spreading. His opinion was that it might become a useful substance for military purposes, if only a practical means could be devised to explode it. Zinnin also suggested to Alfred that he should experiment with nitroglycerin as a possible explosive for Emmanuel's naval mines. With the Crimean War ending in 1856, the need for naval mines decreased which resulted in an abrupt halt to the manufacturing of Emmanuel's naval mines. Since Alfred was able to speak five different languages, he traveled to London and Paris to study abroad and raise money for his father's company. Unfortunately, the bankers in Paris were not willing to loan money to Emmanuel's factory in St. Petersburg. Upon returning home to St. Petersburg in 1860, Alfred started experimenting with nitroglycerin developed by Professor Sabrero. In 1863, he started focusing on making nitroglycerin a safer and more reliable explosive. Alfred knew that if he could tame nitroglycerin, he could open a new and unbeatable market that he himself could control. This is what drove his determination to invent dynamite. He tried many times, but in 1864, disaster strikes, and one of his nitroglycerin testing factories in Hellenberg explodes, killing his brother Emil and other factory workers. This became known as the Hellenberg Disaster. After this accident, the authorities learned that substance nitroglycerin was extremely dangerous and they banned the experimentations of it in the city limits of Stockholm. Undeterred by this disaster, Alfred succeeds in taming nitroglycerin by safely combining nitroglycerin with a pulp-like substance named Kaiselgar, creating a thick paste. This paste could then be molded into any shape, inserted into plastic or other containers, and safely be transported. He named this explosive dynamite, after a Greek word dynamis, which means power. The only problem Alfred faced was a safe way to ignite it. He decided to invent a blasting cap. He eventually invented a blasting cap that could be ignited from far away. Alfred invented this not for military purposes, but to aid the mining industry. Alfred's invention of dynamite not only reduced the cost of blasting rocks, but it also sparked a new product for builders and a basis for new war weapons. His most notable patents for dynamite were given to him by Sweden and England in 1867 and by the U.S. in 1868. After his first patents, 
Alfred started to live his dream of building a market around his own product. Alfred began this process by creating his first factory, Winterviken, or also known as Winter Bay. Winterviken not only had a section that produced nitroglycerin, but it also had a section that produced dynamite and a sulfuric acid factory. With these different sections in mind, Winterviken's goal is not only to start Alfred's company on a good note, but to also manufacture as many goods as possible. It included various acids such as saltpeter and nitrocellulose. Alfred's next factory, one of his most famous, was Krummel, just outside of Hamburg, Germany. Krummel was presented to the Germans by Alfred as Alfred Nobel and Company, but was soon known as Dynamite Octen Gasselstraft, known as DAG. All the buildings in Krummel that worked with nitroglycerin or blasting oil had to be separated. They also had to be sheltered by high embankments and there could only be two people working in the building at a time. Krummel was one of Alfred's best factories because its ground consisted of sterile sand Kaiselgur, which Alfred used to create dynamite. This Kaiselgur proved crucial to all Alfred's production of explosives, but mainly for conducting a safe and tame nitroglycerin. For Alfred, Krummel was his home away from home. He lived in a simple house near Hamburg and worked in his own private laboratory in Krummel. Soon after Krummel, other European and overseas factories started to open up. Other notable factories included Weissacker, Norway, Ardeer, Scotland, Little Ferry, New Jersey, the Giant Powder Works, which was near New York City. Within months, his invention was used by almost all mining companies around the world. One thing that troubled him, though, was that militaries were starting to use it to settle disputes in a way that was not peaceful. To make matters worse, when his brother Ludwig died, a French journalist thought it was Alfred, and so he wrote an obituary. Alfred had the odd experience of reading his own obituary, and learned that his public image was that he was a disturbed man who was obsessed with creating explosives. He started to become concerned that his inventions were creating more conflicts and less compromise. By the end of his life, he became completely engrossed on the issue of world peace because he did not want to be remembered as the man he had read about in the obituary. When he died, his last testament was found and was questioned for four years. The most disputed part was this section. I, Alfred Bernard Nobel, hereby declare, after due consideration, that with regard to the estated that, after my death, I will leave behind the capital which is to be invested by executors in stable securities shall constitute a fund the annual interest on which shall be awarded as prizes to those persons who during the previous year have rendered the greatest services to mankind. The interest shall be divided into five equal parts. One part shall be awarded to the person who has made the most important discovery or inventions in the realm of physics. One part to the person who has made the most important chemical discovery or improvement. One part to the person who has made the most important discovery in the realm of psychology or medicine. One part to the person who has produced an outstanding work of literature in an ideal direction. One part to the person who has done the most or best work for the Brotherhood of Nations, the abolishment or reduction of standing armies, as well as for the establishment and spread of peace congresses. The section of the will gave one-fifth of his estate to the establishment known as the Nobel Foundation, which issues the Nobel Prize. The first ceremony was held in 1901. The Lorettes were Sully Prudahom and John Henry Dunnett. Today, the prize laureates receive an award for their works in science, medicine, literature, economics, or world peace. They also receive various medals, a diploma, and around one million dollars. Each diploma is created by the Swedish Academy to match the achievements and personalities of the recipients. The ceremonies are held in the Stockholm Concert Hall on December 10th each year because it is the day Alfred died. The Dichotomy of Alfred Nobel, the brilliance of his inventions, and the burden of world peace. Alfred died on December 10, 1896, due to natural causes. His life outside his family involved two things, his inventions and the element of peace. Throughout his life, Alfred had displayed his love for inventing and explosives. But in the later part of his life, he began to have qualms about his reputation. The three events that led to these qualms were the Hellenberg disaster, the fact that his inventions were being used for unpeaceful purposes, and the mistaken obituary he found of him by the French journalist. The Hellenberg disaster showed him how easily that his inventions could take human life. By the end of his life, he found himself torn between love of his inventions and the issue of peace. In his final act of life, he threw the burden of peace off of himself when he wrote his will. And so ended the great life of Alfred Nobel.